all know what it's like to be at the bottom and alone and just broken and bound, bound by struggle, bound in chains. And the reason we are who we are today is because we met somebody that broke our chain. Amen. That's right. And so um, every time I hear that song, it just takes me back. It takes me way back. Um, so.
did this is I saw the same person write the same thing on Tuesday and Friday and Saturday. Well, I enjoy your zeal. You do not have to do that because I will get all the lists and do the best I can, the best we can to uh, fulfill those needs. Um, in case you didn't know, we're a small church. We're, we're mighty in, in uh, what spirit. In what? Spirit. We're mighty in spirit. We are mighty in spirit. Amen. We are mighty in spirit and we're mighty in serving the Lord, but we are small in number. We're not small in number as a community, but we're small in number for what we have to put into the church. So we operate on what's given to us 99% of the time. Um, so whatever we come in now, I can tell you this, the Lord is so faithful. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, somebody, it was winter time and it was a really, really cold winter. I think it might've been the first winter we were out here when it was like 22 degrees all the time. And somebody asked for one of those masks that covers your face, you know? like oh man we don't got something like that but i'll pray for it the very next day somebody gave me one and i cannot tell you how many times we needed something and we'll pray for it now again you can put a wife on the list i don't know if you'll get one i will pray for it for you um or an electric generator or uh, an electric razor or whatever you just feel free to write anything on the list we do the best we can to get you the things that you need um, let's see if I did all that. Um, okay, also, when I go through and I fill all this stuff and I put it in the back end of the vehicle and I bring it the following Saturday, I will have it that Saturday and the next Saturday. I'll have it for two weeks. And then at the end of that, because sometimes stuff happens, right? Sometimes you just, you can't, you forgot it on Saturday. You didn't know what time it was. You're sick and you're at the hospital or you're, visiting our local facility that gives you three hots and a cot. Whatever the reason is, and you miss this Saturday, I will have it the next Saturday. But after that, I put it back in stock. So, if you show up five weeks from now and say, I put something on the list, do you have it? Guess what I'm gonna say? Nope, I put it back in stock. So you can rewrite it on the list if it's something that you still need. Um, you can only pick up your stuff. You can't pick up other people's things. shoes down, I need to know what size you wear. I cannot guess. Although I'm a pretty good guesser like that. If you put that you need batteries, I need to know how many you need. If you put AA batteries, I might just give you one. Just because I'm funny like that. But, so keep all that. I don't know that was a lot of stuff. Keep all that in mind. It helps It helps me get you the things that you guys need and uh, it helps things flow better. Um, 
He had a backpack and a trash bag full of clothes. And today he has an amazing, beautiful life. He has a business. He's settled. He's got a home that he's buying because the blood of Jesus is enough. Amen. Somebody say that with me. The blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus is, enough. is enough. That's right. So anyway, and then... Paul writes to us in 
exhaustive list in case we're confused about what love is because sometimes we need that sometimes we're like that um way back in the day when my children were the age of my grandchildren we had come to the place that they were pretty much old enough that they could they could be trusted 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 they could be trusted to be alone at home for about an hour and a half until i got home from work but i had to make a list Okay, here's the re here's the things that you can call me at work for. Uh, if you can call me at work if there's a fire or if somebody's hurt or I don't remember what the third one was. But there were three reasons. Three reasons you can call me at work. So uh, one day I get a phone call from my son who was about nine at the time and he had two teenage sisters and he calls and he said, Mom, I smell smoke. Natalie hit me. Okay. He was not calling about the smoke smell. He was calling to tattle and rat out his sister. So I had to change the guidelines to roaring flames. Oh yeah. Gushing blood and bones that are protruding from the skin. Don't call me and tell me you think you broke your foot because your sister put you, you know, pushed you down. I need to, there's either bones sticking out, blood that's gushing, or roaring flames. Flames. And ironically enough, I didn't really get any more phone calls. But God does that for us when he explains what love is. Because, two reasons. Number one, the, the, the Greek, the Greek that the New Testament was written in, they have a lot better language than we do, okay? They, they have four words for love. We have one. I love these brownies. And I love my grandchildren, but I don't love them the same. I would die for this. I would not die for that. You know what I'm saying? Well, I would say that it might be a good cause if they loved it that much. Amen. Box is hot. Okay. Also, it's very empty. The, love, the word love? Oh, it's just... Oh. It happens. It's usually empty like this when it's the first weekend of the month. But it is what it is. Everybody that's here, God knew before he ever created the earth that we would all be here today for this. Um, anyway, so love is empty too. <laughs> Although that's not what you were talking about. It's an empty word. People throw around the word love. And so God took... And defined it for us because we would take and adulterate it. And so in <laughs> Corinthians, do what? Here's my thing. Love is not a word, it's a group of being. Well, you can't really it's really put a definition on that. It's a it's an action. People think it's a feeling, but it's really not. It's an action. Actually, let's just read it. It's a sense of being. It's well, it is the being too. Um remember Angie Andy Andrews. Oh yeah. Andy Andrews, who's a guy that we like to listen to, said, um, let's see, how did he word the question? He said, uh, how, how do you define someone who loves you? Oh, yeah. He, he asked, he said, how do you define someone who loves you? Which is a really good question, okay? And, and the common answer that he got was someone that accepts you as you are. And he said, no, the guy at the drive-thru at McDonald's accepts you as you are. That guy doesn't even know your name, much less loves you. Somebody that will hold you accountable, somebody that will build you up, somebody that will encourage you, somebody that will, um, you know, Scripture says that an iron sharpens iron as a friend sharpens another. A, a friend will say, hey, that ain't cool what you're doing. It's going to hurt you in the long run. Um, so... Love is not, someone that loves you is not defined by somebody that accepts you as you are. That's the guy at the drive through window at McDonald's. Um, now this is, this is the passion translation. You guys have heard it like this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. Does that sound familiar? Okay, here's, here's the passion translation. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle 
and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor seek, selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not is easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat for it never gives up. The ESV and NIV says, um, and probably the King says, love never fails. I had a, a young lady that came to our Valentine's event from school tell me yesterday we had a, an opportunity that we took communion together and shared with each other things that were on our heart for other people. <coughs> things that we wanted to encourage them with that we admired about them and whatever. And the young lady came to me and she said, from the moment I met you, I could tell that you always see the gold in people. That no matter how much dirt they're covered with, and she didn't mean physically, she meant the masks and the facade and the things that we wear. Go, girl. Um, no matter how much dirt, because it has to be a girl for driving like that. I'm just saying. Anyway, just kidding. She said, no matter how much dirt they're covered with, no, how, no matter how much they pretend to be something that they're not, you see the gold in them. And she's right, and I've said it before many a time. If I were to pick the greatest blessing that the Lord has given me is to be able to look at anybody and see them how God sees them. And let's talk about what that means. Because here's what I used to think. When God looked at me, he saw Mary the alcoholic, Mary the adulterer, Mary the drug addict, married the liar, married the cheater, married the fill in the blank. With shame and guilt and condemnation. And I, I thought that that's how the father, actually I didn't call him father, I didn't even call him papa or daddy. I called him God because it sounded so authoritative. But Jesus says that we can call him daddy. When he said Abba, father, that's daddy, father, daddy, God, daddy. He's our daddy. So, when I learned that when the Lord looks at me because of the price that the cross paid, that's not what he sees. When he looks at me, he sees a daughter. When he looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When he looks at me, he doesn't see anything that I have done in the past. Because Scripture says that, that he takes our sins when we repent, which means we confess our sins, we turn around and walk the other way that he takes our sins and casts them into the sea of forgetfulness. He takes and throws them as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. You know who remembers them? Two people. Us and the enemy. We have a hard time letting go of that. We have a hard time um, forgiving ourselves and then the enemy does not does not want us to forget so he constantly reminds us because you know why he wants us to stay stuck in shame and condemnation because if we can stay stuck in shame and condemnation we cannot walk in our true identity that god created us in we cannot walk as a son or a daughter it's shame and condemnation and guilt it's an orphan mindset it is not a kid of the true king mindset when I understand my identity, I can walk in love. I can see the gold in people when they cannot see it themselves. I can see the good. I can, I can um, just get the love of the Father. That's what we're called to do. Okay, all that was a commercial. Let's see what we're talking about today. Um, no, that's the gospel. Yeah, Revelation. We've been talking about um, the Father being our first love been talking about the love that we have for the Father. And a couple of weeks ago, I know that I read this, and um, uh, John the Revelator went to the throne room and got a message from God, okay? 
This is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God with us. And in Revelation, it's the revelation, you know, when you had that eye-opening moment, okay, it's the revelation spoken from Jesus to John, given to us. And he writes seven letters to seven churches in the beginning. And he says this to the church in Ephesus. Uh, I know all that you've done for me. You have worked hard and persevered. You know that you don't tolerate evil. I know that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and proved that they're not, for they were imposters. I also know how you bravely endured trials and persecutions because of my name, yet you have not become discouraged. That's some good stuff. They, they, they know their word. They know people that aren't on target. And they held steadfast through all of the persecution that came against them. Then he says this. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. So, if we... I, I remember when I fell in love with Jesus for the very first time. I felt, I felt pure, I felt clean, I felt light, I, the trees were brighter, the air was purer, you know, that everything in life was different. And that was July the 28th, 1978. A long time ago. I'm old. And so, a long time ago when I felt all that and I was so in love with Jesus, I wanted to go around and tell everybody about it. People would say to me, what's new? What's wrong with you? What's new with you? What's up with you? And I'd go, it's really simple. It's Jesus. I met Jesus. I didn't find him. He wasn't lost. I met him. I met him face to face. I came in contact with him, and it made everything great. Then life happened. I got pregnant as a senior in high school. I felt shame and condemnation. I walked away from the Lord. Then I came back to him in 1997 things have just been uphill from there and I'd have to say in the past two years it's been like ramped uphill like quickly uphill so he said I have this against you you have left your first love now first love means two things the love that you had at first and the first love that you felt for him when you first fell in love with him I know that I used last week um, my husband and I as an example okay I love him more today than I did when we first fell in love 13 years ago. That's what love does. Love grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. It never stays the same. Love is not an emotion. It is an action word. It's something that we put into action. You know, just for each other, we're to count others more significant than ourselves, but especially in marriage. So if we recognize that we are all the bride of Christ, then we ought to be daily trying to one-up each other doing better for someone else than us. So, Jesus said, I got this against you. You've abandoned your first love. Now he goes on to write to another church in Laodicea this. He says, He says in, in uh, Revelation 3, I know all that you do, and I know that you are neither frozen in apathy nor fervent in passion. How I wish you were one or the other. But because you're neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. For you claim I am rich and getting richer. I don't need a thing. But he says, yet you are clueless that you are miserable, poor, blind, barren and naked. That's an ouch. They thought they were a-okay. They got 60-40. They got it right 60% of the time. Maybe 70-30. Maybe even 90-10. I got it going on. I'm pretty good. I'm kind of in the right spot. I do the best I can. Hey, I'm only human. I can't be perfect like Jesus. I got it right most of the time. They thought they had it going on, but Jesus said to them specifically, Yet you are clueless that you're miserable, poor, blind, barren, and naked. I would hate to think that at the end of time, 
that what I thought was right, I got to the end and realized that it wasn't. I would hate to think that what I thought was good, that getting it right most of the time, wasn't 100%. Um, I heard a quote by um, a guy named G. Campbell Morgan. I think that he was probably old. I don't know who he was. But he said this. No amount of activity in the king's service will make up for the neglect of the king. I'm going to say that again. No amount of activity in the king's service will make up for the neglect of the king. It is not what you think, it's not what you do, it's who you are in Him. Before we do anything kind, before we put others first, before we walk in love, before we extend grace and mercy to other people, before we come out on Saturdays and bring food and needs lists, before any of that, it is about Him. It is about nothing else but Him. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. It is not doing stuff for him. It's being somebody in him. It's not going to church. It's being the church. It's not reading the word. It's becoming the word because it's all about him. It is about Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not Jesus and something. It's not Jesus and being baptized. It's not Jesus and giving your money to the church. It's not Jesus and going to church. It's not Jesus and speaking in tongues. It's not Jesus and giving to the needy. It is just Jesus. 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 That's right. Jesus. No amount of service to the king will make up for ignoring him. Which is why I said earlier, if this is your only spiritual feeding for the week, not only are you starving, but you're neglecting the king. You are not in love with him he's not your first love and you don't have the first love you had for him when you first fell in love with him but there's hope there is always hope always um in matthew eleven twenty eight, which was our key verse for our um halfway our halfway house that we had You've heard it like this. All who are weary and heavy laden. Yeah, 
lost her father-in-law very unexpectedly. And then yesterday, um, her name is Melinda. Melinda had gone to the Dollar General there in Tyler. It's whatever the little town is. Art. 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 The art. Um, that makes me think of that little brown thing that was a puppet. But that was Al. Anyway, um, she went to the Dollar General. She had gotten all of her stuff. She stood in line, she checked out, she paid for her stuff, and when she went to go get her bag, she froze. She just stood there for a second, and then she began to seize. Then she fell backward, and a very nice gentleman that was there caught her. They rushed her to the hospital, to Mother Francis Hospital, and 12 hours later, she was dead. She had a massive brain aneurysm, king that we are in service to, the king that's our first love, the king that created everything, the king that has our, his affectionate eye on us, that we should have our affectionate eye on him, the king, the king of kings, Lord of lords, the God of the universe, the creator of everything, with Jesus sitting at his right hand, the Messiah, who is our high priest, who sat down beside him because his job was done. Because when he hung on the cross as me, not for me, as me, and became my sin till I could become his righteousness, as the high priest, he was done. Because when the veil tore from the top to the bottom, because heaven came to earth so that we could eventually, not the reason we get saved, go to heaven, everything changed. Amen. And in a moment, everything changed for Melinda. Yeah. Nothing, that was not on her list of things to do for today, I promise you. <laughs> They were planning on creating a flower bed as soon as this whole spell was over. They were planning on doing some upgrades on the house. They were planning on, and Bible tells us very specifically, don't worry about tomorrow. It's got enough problems for itself. Today. Today is what we have. Today is all that we have. Um, one of my favorite um, pastors, his name is Eric Gilmore, he said this. The greatest sin. Okay, let me ask you this. If you could know what the greatest sin was, that would be helpful because you could probably avoid it like the Black Plague, right? I mean, if I, if I knew that this was the worst thing I could do, and I'm not talking about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're not going there. If, if I knew that this particular thing is what would hurt him the most, then at all costs, that is what I would avoid. So here's what he said. The greatest sin in the world is to give the attention that Jesus deserves to something far inferior to him. The greatest sin in the world is to give our first love attention that should be for Jesus to something else. To self. To drugs. To to whatever you want to put it, fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Okay? If it's not Jesus, if your greatest attention it's a sin for me to give my greatest attention to my husband or my grandchildren or you that belongs to the king. Are y'all with me on that? Does that make sense? The greatest sin in the world is to take our first love that belongs to him and give it somewhere else because it is far, far inferior. Romans 1 tells us that the world is and was and will continue to be at a point that it worships instead of the creator, the created. Whatever the created is, whether it be your own self, whether it be a car, a job, a tent, a person, fill in the blank. The greatest sin in the world is to give the attention that belongs to the king to something that's far less deserving. Now, mind you, I quickly step in the place if, if given the opportunity for my husband to die or for me to die. Because the love that I had for him is immense. I mean, I don't, you know, I look at those little emojis. I got one of those little apps on my phone and it's got um, pink hair 
and glasses like me so it looks like me whatever that's called you know bit emoji and i look and i look for the love you ones you know and i'm like oh, really oh that's, that's really cute but that doesn't you know it, there's no words there's no little bit emojis there's no little pictures that i can send to my husband that really conveys the love that i have for him but if but I, 50 bucks might do it. Or a cookie. <laughs> hey, I got these for you, babies. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's unconditional. And you know, that, that word, you know, we know that the Father has unconditional love for us, and we can kind of grasp it, but we have a finite mind for an infinite God. Okay, that means we have uh, a, an incapable mind of understanding something that is incapable of being understood this side of time. So unconditional love, while you think you may have it, we often don't. You know, I have unconditional love for my teenagers until they act like teenagers. You know, and then it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to. I brought you into this world, I can take you out, you know, one of them kind of things, okay? It's, so, um, unconditional love, while we think we may have it, isn't always that. I'm going to leave you with one more. <laughs> oh, I'm a great kid. I love them. Um, this was said by a Ugandan pastor to one of our pastors at school. And I just want you to think about this for just a second. He said, the gospel, okay, that's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that I have always been speaking to you about. Jesus died on the cross as me. When we understand who he is, we recognize we're in need of a Savior, then we have the opportunity to choose him as Savior, die to self, live for him, and heaven comes and dwells in us. And one of these days is a bonus. We get to go to heaven and be with him for eternity. Um, so that's the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel message is like the perfect meal that only God could prepare. Think about that. Whatever your perfect meal is, a steak and potatoes, and, okay, or a plate full of cookies, or whatever your perfect meal is. A giant block of cheddar. Okay, that'll keep me in the bathroom for a week. All right. The gospel message is like the perfect meal that only God pre could prepare, and your life, are you with me? Your life is the bowl God decided to serve the perfect meal in. Wow, when I heard that, I heard the I was like, oh, God has created the perfect meal called the gospel message, and he decided at some point in time that I, in my life, was a bowl that was worthy for that message to go into so that it could come out of. Then he went on to say this, make sure your bowl's not dirty or nobody will want to eat your meal. Whoa! Are y'all with me? Did y'all understand that? God, the gospel message that God has provided to us as an answer for all of our problems is like the perfect meal in your life, your heart, your mind, your walk, the place you are in life is the bowl that he wants to put that meal in so that you can serve it to others. Don't let your bowl be dirty or nobody will want your meal. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this message. I thank you that even with distractions, that the words that are spoken will dwell deep inside of us and change our life and change our walk so that people will see our lives and want what we have. God, you are so good to us. You are so good to us. Holy Spirit, the fact that you dwell on earth with us and in us and use us kingdom in service to the king of kings we are humble father thank you that not only did you decide that your son was the worthy payment for all our nastiest our worst moment not only did you count it a privilege to send him he counted it a privilege to go to the cross love kept him on the cross love for us kept him on the cross love for us kept him there so that his blood is enough to transform our lives so that the bowl of our life 
holds a meal that other people want. Thank you, Father, for grace and mercy. Thank you for sobriety. Thank you for freedom in Christ. Because whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. Thank you that we can live and walk and talk and look like Jesus when he walked on this earth. Thank you that you've given us unconditional love, that you've given us forgiveness, that you have poured out for us blessing upon blessing upon upon blessing. Thank you for our meal today. I ask that it bless our bodies and nourish us. I thank you for the spiritual feeding that you gave us. I ask that it would bless our soul, that our minds would be transformed, that our hearts would be crushed and live in service for you. I thank you for the needs list. I thank you for all that you do for us. I thank you for our community. And I thank you for all that you have called us to. We love you. You're a good father to us. Thank you, Jesus, for that price that you paid. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing life with us. Speak to us in the daytime and in our sleep so that we hear from you. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.